extremely valuable. Bastra Abharana with garments and ornaments. Kanchuka by a particular type of garment used in Vrindavan. Ushdisha with turbans. Bhushita being nicely dressed. Gopa all the cowherd men. Samayayu came there. Rajan O King, <coughs> Maharaj Parikshit, Nana, Nana, various, various. Upayana, Upayana, presentations, presentations. Panaya, Panaya, holding in their hands. O King Parikshit, the cowherd men dressed very opulently with valuable ornaments and garments, such as coats and turbans, decorated in this way and carrying various presentations in their hands, they approached the house of Nanda Maharaj. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. O King, <clears throat> when we consider the past condition of the agriculturist in the village, we can see how opulent he was. Simply because of agricultural produce and protection of cows. At the present, however, agriculture having been neglected and cow protection given up, the agriculturist is suffering pitiably and is dressed in a niggardly torn cloth. This is the distinction between the India of history and the India of the present day. By the atrocious activities of Ugra Karma, how we are killing the opportunity of human civilization. <coughs> Om Akyan Timidandasya Gyananjana Chalakaya Chakshuru Militam Jena Dasmai Sri Gurave Namaha Swayam Rupa Katamayam Tadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Jutha Patakamalam Guru Vaishnavam Sri Sri Rupam Sadra Jatham Sahatana Raghunatham Vitam Tham Sajivam Advaitam Sapadutam Padijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahatana Lalita Sri Vishakan Vitamscha Krishna Kaduna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namostate Tatta Kanchana Godangi Radhe Brindabhaneshwari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi 
अनमामी हरि प्रिय वंश कल्पत रूप्य कृपा सिंधुभ्य वाणिभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नमो नम श्रीकृष्णा चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैता गदाधर श्रीवासि गौर भक्तवृंद King Pariksit, the cowherd men dressed very opulently with valuable ornaments and garments, such as coats and turbans. Decorated in this way and carrying various presentations in their hands, they approach the home of Nanda Maharaj. <laughs> we are reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 10. Chapter 5, entitled, The Meeting of Nanda Maharaj in Vasudev. Text number 8. The residents of Vrindavan, they are... being described here not only in a historical context regarding Krishna's appearance in the world, but also as an example for all people, places and times of the nature of bhakti. Everything has its spiritual purpose. If we understand and practically apply that understanding to its relation with Krishna. When we understand that we are eternal souls, Atma, Mamayavam so Jiva Loke, Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. We are part of Krishna, infinitesimal parts of Krishna. Like the ray of the sun is a part of the sun, quality of this, qualitatively one with the sun. But because of quantitative difference, the nature of the jiva or the atma is jivera swarupoy krishna renityadas. Eternally we are servants of Krishna. Some things we can change, but certain principles are eternal, unchangeable. We are always subordinate to the absolute truth. We are always in a position of a servant of the absolute truth. <coughs> Our choice is whether we want to serve the internal potency of the Lord or the external potency of the Lord. To be subordinate to the all-loving, all-compassionate, all-beautiful, supreme Krishna by assisting Sri Radha in their eternal pastimes of unending happiness or servants of the material energy the Maya Shakti, subordinate to lust, envy, anger, arrogance, 
greed, and endless illusions. Daivi he shugunamayi mamamaya duratyaya. This material energy, which is Krishna's own divine <coughs> energy, is all powerful. It keeps everyone who wants to be independent of the loving service of the Lord in the service of their mind, in the service of their senses, birth after birth after birth. But when we actually understand the truth as it is revealed in Srimad Bhagavatam, Bhagavad Gita, that we are all part of God, that we are of, of the spiritual essence of God. Bhaktaram Jagatapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram when we see that everything is Krishna's property and when you water the root of the tree, the tree every part of the tree is satisfied it's a very simple concept nature is teaching us the most critical, crucial, essential lessons everywhere we look of what is the goal of life and how to attain it And if we're just a little bit awakened, we can see. We could see the highest lessons, the deepest education, Raja Vidya, wherever we look. But when the ego covers us with this veil, then we've become so dull. We see every plant, every tree. If you water the root, every part of the tree is nourished. If you water the branches and the twigs, even if you water the flowers, it gets it wet, makes it shine a little, but it doesn't really nourish it. Aham sarvasya prabhavo matta sarvam pravartate Krishna is the root, the cause of all causes, the source of everything. When Krishna is satisfied by our love, by our service, then automatically our, what we desire most, unending love, happiness, manifests within ourselves. We are nourished. But a civilization, we're all on the same tree, and everyone's fighting. Brothers and sisters are fighting. Neighbors are fighting. Castes are fighting. Religions are fighting. Nations are fighting, races are fighting, because everyone wants to get more water for their branch or for their twig. Some people fight over a twig, maybe somebody on a family level. Nationalist level, you're fighting over a branch. This is my branch. And I'm a selfless service because look at all the millions of twigs on my branch. It's not for me. I and mine. Yes, nations are fighting. Religions are fighting. Everybody's fighting. But the solution to this miserable situation is just recognizing there's one root that we all have on the tree of life. Sarvalokameshwara Janmadya Shayataha. This is the first aphorism of Vedanta Sutra. Everything's there if we just understand this. That the absolute truth is from whom everything emanates, the root of everything. 
if we just learn to, to satisfy the Lord, all problems can be solved. And even if there are apparent external problems, we're transcendental to all of them. That's the solution. On a physical and mental level, the mind is always moving around. And as far as the body, whoever we are, we're going to grow old and we're going to die. What is the solution? The solution is not fighting with all of our might through our technologies and our sciences and our um, athletics to somehow or other get the body to live longer. Those things are there. The solution is simple. To realize that the person within the body who's actually me is eternal. When your car gets old and you have to trade it in for a new one, we don't have memorial services. <laughs> we don't have, you know, our best well-wishing relatives offering eulogies. We just move on with life. That's the way automobiles are. When we understand that I am the eternal soul and I am the eternal servant of God and Krishna is the re root of all that exists and real happiness and real purpose is in satisfying Krishna, this is bhakti, then we see the whole world through different eyes. We don't see the world in terms of ahamamati. I am who I think I am, and, and you are who I think you are. And this is mine, and this is yours. We see everything is the energy of Krishna. Everything is beautiful and divine when we see Krishna's connection to it. Because Krishna is all beautiful. He is Shamsundar. He is all attractive. Momentous Krishna tells in Gita, one who sees me everywhere and everything in me, I'm never lost to that person, nor is that person ever lost to me. So whether we're rich or poor is not really such a important matter. You can be rich and externally but in poverty within. And you can be in poverty externally and be extraordinarily wealthy within. Which is better? Happiness is what happens within Happiness is not about the externals. We all interpret things according to our particular egos. Yes. For some people, sitting in a crowded room like this is the most blissful state of their life, the best day of their life. <laughs> Being with 2,000 devotees sitting together, crowded in front of the supreme, beautiful Radha Gopinath, listening to Srimad Bhagavatam. But take someone else in here, and they'll think this is absolutely miserable. <laughs> I mean, if you brought somebody who's not thinking in terms of devotion, you release them from a prison and put them in this room and they'll say, just bring me back to the prison. <laughs> it's not so crowded. 
and I could listen to, you know, the music I like to hear. And so we interpret everything according to our state of consciousness. But actually everything in its original state is meant to share our love for Krishna with each other. That's what community and society is on a spiritual level. Whatever intelligence each of us has, whatever skills, whatever wealth, whatever property, and everything else. Community means it only has one purpose. It's a facility to share our love for Krishna with each other. So here we find the Brijavasis. They're dressing very opulently to share their joy with each other, the joy that Krishna has come to the world. It's not that the Brijabhasis are thinking, well, everything belongs to Krishna, so let's just burn all our nice clothes and go to Nanda Maharaj's house wearing old copans. <laughs> They could have done that, yes. Everything belongs to Krishna. The whole purpose of life is detachment and run renunciation. So just give away our clothes, burn our clothes, and let's just put on our copans and celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're wearing beautiful silks and gold and silver and jewels and, and, and elegant turbans because that's what all these things are for it's we we dress ourselves in such a way according to the occasion to celebrate our love for krishna and to share our love for krishna with each other and when the brijabhasis were dressed like this during the nandotsava we can know for sure None of the ladies were looking at some other gopi thinking, saying to her husband, why don't I have a sari like that? <laughs> why she has diamonds on her necklace and I only have pearls. <laughs> no, the, even if you just have pearls. When you see another gopi with diamonds, you're, it brings you ecstasy. You're thinking, just see how she's using these diamonds to offer her love for Krishna. And that's what makes us happy, to see how people are making Krishna happy. Envy is when we're thinking, I'm in the center. But bhakti is when Krishna's in the center. So when we see somebody else doing something wonderful to make Krishna happy, that makes us happy because Krishna is happy. So everyone is dressed in their best clothes with their best turbans and nobody's jealous of each other. Nobody's competing in a mundane way with each other. Everyone's just happy giving, being the best they are. This body is Krishna's body. To make the body beautiful for Krishna is devotion. To make the body for our own arrogance has the opposite effect. Yes, when Krishna called the gopis to, to the Ras Lila, you know, they decorated themselves very nicely. They, made, they tried to make themselves very beautiful for Krishna. in 1966. The first marriage within the International Society for Krishna Consciousness was Mukunda, that now he's Maharaj, 
and Janaki Devi. So we'll discuss this evening because we're going to be celebrating a memorial for Yamuna Devi, our very, very beloved worshipable God sister for the afternoon program. So we'll discuss that aspect of it this afternoon. But interestingly, Srila Prabhupada made all the arrangements because he wanted this marriage to be completely spiritual. He invited the relatives and Hare Krishna. <laughs> Sounds like some brahmachari didn't want to hear this story. <laughs> I don't hold them against them because I used to be like that too. <laughs> so, you know, Srila Prabhupada was teaching them a whole culture where God is in the center, where love for Krishna is the purpose. And Srila Prabhupada himself. You know, he cooked a 15-course feast with his own hands. He made every preparation himself. Yamuna Devi was making kachuris, but Prabhupada cooked everything else. For 40 people, in a tiny little kitchen, not like the kitchen we have here with big stoves and big pots. He just had little pots and just a little tiny stove and he cooked all these preparations himself. From 11 in the morning till 5 in the evening they were cooking. And Janaki, who was getting married, she was doing all decorations. And by Prabhupada's arrangements, a few days before there was an initiation and they decorated. But there was even more beautiful decorations for the marriage. They were making garlands and stringing them and putting them all around. You know, it was Prabhupada's apartment where it was all happening in the Lower East Side of New York. And then what happened, everyone was really taken aback. Because Srila Prabhupada told Mukunda and Janaki, how they should dress. And all the devotees and all the guests and everybody else who was assembled there, there was about 30, 40 people, they, some of them knew Janaki for years. She never wore makeup or cosmetics. She always dressed really, really simple and plain. And now she came in for her marriage and she was wearing a beautiful red silk sari. It was even a culture shock for her. <laughs> what to speak of everyone who was seeing her. And she had makeup on her eyes and wherever else you're supposed to put. <laughs> and she had jewelry. And people, devotees were thinking, you know, which, this, is, this philosophy is about renunciation. <laughs> Before she was a devotee, she was just wearing old jeans and, and shirts, you know, whatever they wore. I don't, and now she looked just like a deity. <laughs> What kind of renunciation is this? They're still waving. <laughs> oh, 
we have about 150 brahmacharis. <laughs> But this was Prabhupada's arrangement. She was, she was beautiful and he was very well dressed too for Krishna. And that was an austerity for them. So to dress beautiful for Krishna is Krishna consciousness. If that's the way we can best serve according to time, place, and circumstance. It's a matter of consciousness. You know, somebody could, could put the same red sari and the same jewels and the same cosmetics and put it on and it's just completely arrogant and mundane. And another person, Janaki, puts it on and it's an offering of transcendental love and devotion. And Prabhupada is so happy and so proud. Bhakti is not only a philosophy, it's a culture, it's a way of life. It's beautiful. Where everything, when there's with, as soon as the false ego comes in, it spoils the beauty of everything on a deeper level. But where there's humble, selfless, sincere devotion, understanding everything is for Krishna. Yes, the gopis were dressing very nicely to meet Krishna, but they weren't doing it to show off their own beauty. And they were doing it because whatever I have, it's for Krishna's pleasure. Krishna, enjoy. It's the act of devotion Krishna accepts. Devotees, we take bath in the morning. Why are we taking baths in the morning? Because it's Krishna's body. And we're going to use this body for Krishna. So we want this body to be the best it could be for Krishna. In this way, when we put on the tilak, we're consecrating our body as the temple of Krishna. You know, when people are superficial and external, we, under, we forget the essence. Bhakti Vinod Thakur says, in the age of Kali, People may wear the Kanti Mala and Tilak, but they're simply the servants of Kali. If we don't have Vaishnav character, there's no meaning to Tilak. If we don't have Vaishnav character, there's no meaning to Kanti Mala. Krishna's not going to save you because of the Mala. Krishna's going to save you because your consciousness is in harmony with what the Mala and the Tilak represents. Humility, dedication, faith, and love. That's what it represents. And that's what it reminds us of. And that's what it's supposed to remind everybody who sees it of. But if we don't act according to what it represents, then when people see it, Srila Prabhupada explains that when a disciple misbehaves, people will think what a it, people will see it as a stain on the character of the guru. That's how it's perceived. What we represent is something so holy and sacred. And the way we represent it is holy and sacred. And by, by that is supposed to actually give us the consciousness to strive to live in harmony with that spirit. This beautiful Nandotsa festival that we're... There is such incredible wealth. 
And Srila Prabhupada in purport is explaining that in the days of historical India, this is what the villages were like. The villages were full of life, full of prosperity on every level. When cow protection is valued by the overall society, then taking care of cows brings incredible wealth. Because the concept has so much been stripped away from our modern day of life. Because, peop because it becomes such a consumer oriented civilization or what they asked Mahatma Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? And Gandhi said, I think it's a good idea. <laughs> In other words, there is no civilization really. It's a good idea to have a Western civilization. But the cow is seen just how we could make profits from it. If it gives milk, we'll somehow or other keep it alive. But when the milk production goes down, we can get more money. It becomes a liability economically, but their bodies are an asset. We can make money by killing it. But it costs money to keep it alive. That's the mentality. And when you have that mentality and you see through that lens, it creates massive slaughterhouses. So there's hardly such thing as cow protection in the world today. But we see here, if we actually see the value of compassion, if we actually have higher ideals of what watering the root of the tree is what's going to make us happy, if Krishna's happy with what we do and the integrity and what we do with, then everything will be provided. And it is a fact. In the olden days, where Prabhupada is speaking of, the villages were very prosperous. Because taking care of the cows, protecting them nicely, giving them attention, making them happy, made us happy. And agriculture, actually seeing the earth as our own mother, who's providing everything, and instead of just exploiting to make as much profits from as little space of land as possible, without really considering that after some years the topsoil is destroyed and the earth itself is polluted and what we give to our grandchildren and great-grandchildren may be nothing, but it doesn't matter. Let's just amass what we can now and take from the earth and take from the cow. because that consciousness has pervaded so much the world. Now the villages, there's so much poverty. There's so much lack of education. There's so much lack of medicine. There's so much lack of resource. And people from the villagers to come to a city is like going to heavenly planet and millions and tens of millions are leaving their villages because they're so desperate to come to a city because they've seen some Bollywood movies and they think that this is what it's like in Mumbai. And millions flood in here and then they realize there's really not that much more here. There's more rats, 
more people, more pollution. And the people back in the villages, they hardly have a chance. It's not the fault of the people of the village, it's, it's, it's the fault is the holistic vision of how society could be. Food is wealth. And the Bridge of Aussies, they were not mining, but they had diamonds and they had gold and they had silver and they had rubies and they had all these other things. More than anybody today in Bombay. <laughs> they had more than any of the jewelry stores down the road. And all they did was grow vegetables and take care of cows and churn milk. But because they did it in such a beautiful way, in such a compassionate way, and because Krishna was so pleased with them, you know, they can trade it with the people who did do mining and everything else, and everybody had everything because it was a compassionate spirit. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining by the atrocious activities of Ugrakama, we are killing the opportunity for human civilization. And that means balance. Balance means we could have all these different types of occupations and industries, but the balance is based on our consciousness. When Krishna is in the center, everything automatically, naturally becomes balanced. But when ego and greed is in the center, then everything becomes off balance. Because even farmers who are, you know, if they're egoistic and greedy, they're going to fight just as much as anybody else. There's mafias in the cities, there's mafias in the villages. Because of arrogance and greed. Nandotsav is the way life is meant to be. Where everybody according to our particular roles, we can use what we could use everything for Krishna's service. Now, we don't read about, in Nandotsa, we don't read about sannyasis or rishis or mahatmas wearing beautiful saris and turbans and jewels. They're just dressed like rishis and sadhus. But the grihastas, they're dressed like this. Everybody has their role of how to utilize things. And that's, Varnashram Dharma is not a suppressive, oppressive concept. Varnashram Dharma is meant to uplift everyone to the ultimate state, to encourage everyone, to respect everyone in such a way to bring them to the spiritual world. In this, in this world, that's what Varnashram is about. But because it has been abused, it has been used as a weapon to exploit and suppress people. Even the word makes us think that there's prejudices within it. And it's against the freedom of humanity. Not at all. Krishna created the system. Aham bija pratapita. He's our father. He's our mother. He's our surata sarvabhutanam. He's our best well-wishing benefactor and friend. He created this so that every single personality could be happy in this life and be encouraged to attain the highest perfection. Where everybody's protecting everybody else with compassion. That's the purpose. So everyone has a role. Yes. As 
far as I know, Janaki didn't dress that way every day. But for her marriage, she did. Because the, the two of them, Mukunda and Janaki, were, they were consecrating the vows of their relationship before God. Just like sometimes in your Bollywood movies, I'm sure you see it. I never saw one, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, you know, it's there in the scriptures also where um, <clears throat> somebody wants to make a human sacrifice. Yes, Jad Bharat, they wanted to make a human sacrifice. So what they usually do, if you know, the, the priests they bathe the body of the human very nicely and then they put perfumes and then they put really fine clothes and jewels and everything because you're offering this body to you know, whatever goddess or god it may be and then Yajnai Sankirtana Praya In the sage of Kali, Sankirtana is the best sacrifice but when someone would do a human sacrifice, you know, in this mode of nature, you know, they would dress that body very nicely because, you know, it's, you're offering this life to, to God. So marriage is a sacrifice. You know, brahmacharis will start coming back with this. <laughs> <laughs> marriage is a sacrifice. What is the sacrifice of marriage? The husband and wife, they are offering their body, mind, souls, their lives before God. They are consecrating their, 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 their lives before God and before the sacred fire. They're making an offering of their lives where two becomes one. And therefore they dress beautifully as an offering of sacrifice, a sacrifice of love. Sacrifice doesn't mean you kill. Sacrifice means you give your life for the higher purpose of love and devotion. So yes, people were confused when Janaki Devi came in. So elegant, beautiful, and opulent. It was shocking. It was absolutely shocking. In this little flat in the Lower East Side for somebody to walk in like this. And Prabhupada was happy. Because yes, this means you are dressing this way, you are doing this way, you're chanting these mantras and everything to make an offering to Krishna. And you're going to be the best you can be in that offering to Krishna. If all you have is a kalpan, that's good enough. But if you can offer more, then that's even better. It's not about arrogance. It's not about false prestige. It's about love. It's about devotion and how everything can be utilized for devotion. Srila Prabhupada came to America on the Jaladuta, an old cargo ship that was actually so old that it was retired soon after Prabhupada was on it. I met one captain in Detroit and he was for the same Skindia steamships. And he used to take the boats. He used to, and he wasn't on the boat that Prabhupada, but he knew the captain. He was best friends with the captain that took Prabhupada, Captain Pandya. And he told me the Jaladutta was very old and they retired it soon after. So that's all, that was the means that Prabhupada had. But then about a year later, Srila Prabhupada took the first airplane in his whole life from New York to San Francisco. And here he was 
on an airplane with his own seat. And he looked down, and when he saw the houses from the first time you're in, when you're 72 years old, and it's the first time you've ever been in an airplane, <coughs> Prabhupada remarked, he said, all the houses look like little matchboxes. <laughs> Everything so relative to our, pers our perspective, yes? We're in this temple now, and it seems so spacious, and it seems so big, and so many people are sitting here with us, and like that. But when you're in an airplane looking down at this temple, it looks insignificant, like a little matchbox Prabhupada says. Prabhupada said about the Jaladuta, when the stormy weather was, he wrote in his diary, he said, it's like a little matchbox floating in the middle of the ocean. Hari Hari. So Prabhupada used an airplane. And then he started using Gargamuni Prabhu. He saw this dictaphone thing in the store, and he was thinking, Prabhupada, this could be good for Prabhupada, because Prabhupada was typing everything. And he had this really old typewriter. So Gargamuni brought, he actually spent practically his whole month's pay to buy this dictaphone for Srila Prabhupada cost something like $150 in 1966. That was a huge amount of money. I know uh, I was working in those days. I had a job and $150 was over two weeks pay of working six days a week, nine hours a day. And he bought it for Prabhupada. It was the latest and best dictaphone where you just talk and it records it. And he was wondering if Prabhupada would accept it. And Prabhupada, he taught him how to do it. And from that day on, Prabhupada was using it to translate. He, can get, he could translate more every day with that. So technology, science, all of these things we have with us today, Yadubar Prabhu and Narasingha Nanda Prabhu, who are into films and movie making and all these other extraordinary types of devotional service. And, you know, when Yadubar Prabhu first met Prabhupada in Surat, you know, he's a movie maker and he's making, you know, he can make documentaries and everything. Prabhupada didn't tell him, throw your camera in the river Yamuna. <laughs> it's Maya. <laughs> well, you know, as far as those cameras that he was using, usually they really are Maya. You know, if you go to, uh, you know, so many of the films being made with the same kinds of cameras really are not helping people to put God in the center of their lives. Srila Prabhupada encouraged, like anything, use your camera to spread God's love. Use your talents to spread God's love. George Harrison was a great musician in the Beatles. He asked Prabhupada if he should quit the band and join the temple. Prabhupada said, you have such talent, use it to inspire people to love Krishna. And he did. And when Prabhupada, the last days of Prabhupada's life, Prabhupada was laying in a bed in Vrindavan and he took off one of his rings from his own finger 
and gave it to, I think, to Malkish Yugoslami and said, give this to George. Prabhupada was remembering him with such love on his last moments. Because he used what he had for Krishna. This is the spirit of Nandotsava. Life is meant to be a celebration. Whether we're brahmacharis or sannyasis or grihastas or vanaprastras or whatever, life is meant to be a celebration. A celebration of our gratitude for Krishna's mercy, Krishna's love, Krishna's beauty, Krishna's pastimes, Krishna's extraordinary gifts. Because Krishna is so beautiful, we could celebrate forever just being grateful that I'm a part of this. To celebrate the good fortune of association of devotees, to celebrate whatever Krishna has given us to utilize in his service. Some people may be living in beautiful homes, brahmacharis. I don't know if any of you have seen, they have these little mosquito nets. That's all they, that's their house. <laughs> and they fold up into a flat little circle, yes? And they stash it, you know, behind their little cupboards. There are this, each brahmachari is a cupboard this big, and behind it they stash a little circle. And it's very good technology. You just somehow or other do something to the circle and it goes boop. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes a mosquito net. <laughs> and you can just put it anywhere or everywhere. And believe it or not, that's exactly what you do if you come to the ashram around 11 o'clock at night, which I usually have to do, and everything's dark. You're just like tripping over all these mosquito nuts everywhere you're going. They're in the front courtyard, they're in the terrace, they're in the temple room, they're everywhere. <laughs> it's like net loca. <laughs> And you're trying to walk around them, but sometimes they're right against each other. It's very difficult. And then you accidentally kick one, and the Brahma Kari goes, Adivo, Adivo! <laughs> you know. Somebody inside, just sleeping on the floor. But they're happy. You know, when they wake up from Mandalarti, they're smiling. They had such good sleep. <laughs> That's their life. It's beautiful. And other people, they're living in very nice homes. Maybe a flat, maybe a house, maybe a mansion, maybe a palace, whatever it may be. But if they understand this belongs to Krishna, and I belong to Krishna, and let me utilize everything for that, with that spirit. From a brahmachari's perspective, the palace is just a sophisticated mosquito net. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Everything's good if our consciousness is good. And we need people in all these different aspects of life. Yes? We need sages living in forests or in ashrams. We need wealthy people. We need farmers. We need everybody together celebrating life, celebrating our good fortune with gratitude. Really, celebration is about gratitude. When we celebrate a person's birthday, it's not just so that you know, they're going to give us something because we came. Well, that's sometimes the way it is. But really, a celebration of a birthday is we're celebrating because we're grateful to that person. 
in our, in our gratitude, we want that person to be happy and we want that person to be blessed. And we're all here for that purpose and we're all happy sharing our gratitude to that person. And that's the way we should be with each other. That's human civilization. And that's the way we should all be together toward Krishna in every situation. That is love. Today is New Year's Day. It is January 1st. 2012. When I was a little boy, I remember I was in KG, kindergarten, and I remember every day we would change the date on the calendar. And the year was 1956. And I can still see that calendar clear in my mind. I would just, because, to tell you the truth, what my teacher, Mrs. Puzzle, was talking about didn't really interest me, so I would just kind of look at the calendar. <laughs> and I was thinking, when I'd be looking at the calendar, you know, and now it's uh, when. I was just looking at the dates one at a time at a time. We're getting closer to the summer vacation. <laughs> <laughs> Where I don't have to come to this <laughs> school anymore. But anyways, that calendar had a big impression. 1956. And when you're a young child like that, you never think you're going to live till 2012. But everything's so relative. New Year's Day, traditionally, New Year's Day is a time for reflection because it's the first day of a new year. It's like a landmark in our life. And it's a time to reflect on where we've been, where we are, and where we're going, and where we want to go. It's a time to ponder on the successes we've had, the good things we've done, and how to nourish that more and more and be grateful for the op that we've had the opportunity to, good think to do wonderful things. And it's also a time to reflect on the mistakes we've made and our failures. In Krishna consciousness, we understand everything is for the purpose of transformation. Punishment is not simply for the purpose of suffering. And suffering is not for the purpose simply of being punished. In this whole cosmic manifestation, suffering, what we may call punishment, it's all actually made for rectification and transformation. So when we repent for doing something wrong, the idea of repentance is not just to inflict suffering and depression upon us, but it's meant to, to penetrate so deep within our heart and our consciousness that we actually learn our lesson and transform. Krishna is all loving. But when the East, sometimes people, they try to impose 
our conception, our human conception, on the absolute truth or God. So yes, there's suffering in this world. Why does a loving, good God allow there to be such intense suffering? We all think that way. We've all heard that again and again. For the body and the mind, yes, it's intense suffering. But Krishna is also seeing the soul. The sufferings are not brought about simply by God. He gives us free will. If we misuse our free will re- perpetually, again and again and again, and we're getting worse and worse, the laws of karma are not simply meant to punish us. The laws of karma are meant to transform us. Now, for the soul to learn a lesson, sometimes very intense suffering is required. From a completely physical platform, how could anyone allow anyone to suffer like this? But when we see from the perspective of the soul, the eternal soul that's full of knowledge and full of bliss, because of our free will. For some people, unless we go through these kinds of things, the soul never really comes to the right conclusions. So the sufferings of this world are simply meant for transformation. We bring upon them you know, ourselves, individually and collectively, by the choices we make, but to help us to choose a healthy life, a pure, blissful life to love God and love each other and be transported beyond birth and beyond death forever. That's the purpose of life. That's the nature of the soul. And every situation is meant to help us to come to the point of transforming our consciousness to seek that and to live by that. So yes, we read about in spiritual or religious histories the concept of repentance. Repentance is healthy if it's done with the proper consciousness. Repentance is not meant to, meant to make us think that we're just so bad and we're so evil and we just become depressed. Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells Arjuna, Arjuna was pretty depressed actually. What is the use of this depression if you're not doing anything positive? It's meant to rise us up to do the right thing with conviction and determination and with plenty of warning, experienced warning. We don't want that to happen again. So in the new year, when we ponder our mistakes, our mistakes of how we have related to Krishna, to God, within as the Paramatma, with our loved ones, with our friends, with the society, within our occupation or whatever, and that repentance is meant to reflect what do I really want in my life and what do I have to do to get there? And it's very important that we do take inventory on a regular basis of what we've done and where we've been. We need shelter. We need guidance. New Year is a time to make these reflections and to help transform our consciousness. Resolutions. I know where I want to go. 
and with great determination, I'm going to dedicate this year, this life, for this purpose. Krishna has appeared in his name. Kali Kale Namarupe Krishna Avatar. Krishna comes in Kali Yuga as his name. Kalera dosani de rajanasti hekamahan guna kirtana deva krishna sya mukta sangha param prajet. Age of Kali is an ocean of faults. And we're like little matchboxes in that ocean of fault. But there's one benediction that simply chanting Krishna's name in the proper spirit of humility and devotion, one can attain the, the ultimate essence of perfection, liberation. To have proper character in our dealings with others, to be an instrument of compassion rather than an instrument of arrogance and greed and lust and envy. And how to do that? We need a strength beyond ourselves. Maya is too strong. We need the association of devotees. And we need to approach the association of devotees or sadhus with the proper spirit. We're coming to serve, not to exploit. We're coming to love. We need the holy name. We need to take shelter of the holy name. It begins by chanting our prescribed minimal every day as qualitatively good as possible. That's a way of expressing our desire to take shelter. And to know that Krishna is non different than his name and to cry out for Krishna because we need him on every level in our relationships with God, with each other, and also in our activities. We want to be as efficient, as proficient internally and externally as possible. We learn our lessons. And we, every year is a time to really move forward and really contemplate, as I said, where we're coming from, what mistakes we've made, what successes we've had and how to use them all to transform, to move higher together as a community, as a family. In one sense, every new year, we're one year closer to death. We should reflect on that. But we should also reflect if we utilize our time, our moments within the next year in a spirit of devotion, then we'll be one year closer to eternal life. I wish you happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Are there any questions? Yes, Gaur Hari, one question and then we will part. And we're going to be having a beautiful ceremony in love and honor of Yamuna Devi this afternoon. So please do come for that. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Thank you for a fantastic class. Uh, Maharaj, you, you may mentioned in your lecture a point to the effect that we should act in a way that represents our parampara, we should act in a way that represents the teachings we have got from Srila Prabhupada. You also mentioned about cow protection, you mentioned about, uh, and the purpose talks about uh, uh, agriculture. Now, in, a, in educational institutes like IIT, we get opportunities almost uh, 
every month, every day, where we get to engage people, engage uh, non-devotees in beautiful projects like Venu Madhuri, sometimes Vada, uh, sometimes Gokul Dham. But the problem is many, very often most of these people do not become devotees or not always they become devotees. So the spirit of Prabhupada's, the, the spirit in which Prabhupada wanted Varanashram to be established may not be maintained, though they may be very sincere in their own capacities. On the other hand, we want to preach direct Krishna consciousness. That, so our time itself is a premium. We have to maintain our sadhana. So Maharaj, how, how, where do we, how do we prioritize? Because uh, we might find that these people do contribute to these projects, but not everyone becomes a devotee. On the other hand, should we just focus completely on giving only Krishna consciousness directly? Hare Krishna. <laughs> Srila Prabhupada wanted to bring everyone closer to Krishna according to their um, particular state of consciousness and according to their particular sincerity. So what is important is we must very much maintain the purity and the integrity of our Siddhanta so that everyone has the chance whenever they may be ready to attain that highest perfection. If we compromise our Siddhanta just to bring people a little closer then we, we don't really facilitate anyone to go back home back to Godhead to taste the ultimate sweetness of prema bhakti so we have to keep the ultimate goal of prema bhakti and the path of how to achieve it always intact that's our ultimate purpose but within that realm we understand According to the Bhagavad Gita, some people can all, are only willing to come so far. So we graciously help them to come as, as close as they can to Krishna. We don't discourage anyone. If we examine Prabhupada's life, we'll see how he did that so expertly. He created here in India the life membership program, right? He was giving pure unalloyed devotional service, but for people who weren't ready or willing to do Sarvadharma and Purijajya, read these books, give a donation, help with this. There were people who were helping him on so many levels. There were people who had other gurus with other philosophies. And Srila Prabhupada, with great love and compassion, encouraged them and appreciated them helping him. Yes? But if they, whenever they become ready, Prabhupada was ready to give them pure unalloyed devotional service too. The concept of Varnashram, Srila Prabhupada defined it in different ways, but it's to include all different levels of society. To somehow other include them in the process of Krishna consciousness. Krishna consciousness is something that interesting, relevant platform by which we can include people in bhakti. That's a fantastic first step. Include them. 
again, you know, Somebody even just touches one thing and appreciates any act of devotional service, their path back to God it begins. It may, they may become perfect in this life, it may be several lives, but that in itself is a great success that you put them in the right direction toward love of God. Yes? We should understand our success is all of these things that you said about. We want to encourage people to come across. We don't want to chase people away because they're not ready to surrender now. 